Thank you all for the opportunity to be here and talk to you. My initial caveat is that, of course, I have way too many slides, but I'm quite attached to them, so I couldn't get rid of them. So I will breeze through some of the ones that just have a lot of statistics and information in them. And now, the official time. So I have a rather incongruous title of my talk here, because what does Vajrayana have to do with GNH, or mindfulness for that matter? And so appropriately, I'm dressed rather incongruously. I'm wearing the robes of a uh, ordained uh, Ngakpa in the non-monastic lineage uh, of uh, Guru Rinpoche. At the same time, I've got my Brooks Brothers shirt and tie on. So we'll see what comes with that. So I do identify with my handsome friend here, the lungfish. These uh, creatures were the first ones to really come onto dry land from the sea. So they're a transitional species. In the evolutionary transmission, uh, they were the first to come onto dry land or kind of in between growing lungs, growing fish, they can dig and burrow into the earth and stay there for five years. And so eventually they became the vertebrae and human beings maybe. So it's kind of like being a hybrid, kind of like grafting a, uh, sorry. Back, back, forward. Kind of like being a hybrid here or grafting a willow branch onto a peach tree. There are those individuals like myself who have taken 40 years inside of Vajrayana trying to come out the other side. We don't know what the result of that evolution is going to be quite yet. So here is the, His Holiness the 16th Karmapava, who I took uh, refuge with in 1980, and then entered into three-year retreat under Kala Rinpoche. 1986, a number of years later, I took my Ngakpa ordination with Kunzang Dechen Lingpa in Assam. So what happens basically when you have a square peg you're trying to put in a round hole, you basically need a big mallet. So after those many decades, trying to pour the 20th century mind into a 10th century spiritual tradition, uh, we don't know quite what we have yet, but here's one case history of my before and after uh, three-year <laughs> retreat. So maybe we created the Dharma Mafia here, I'm not quite sure what. So before we talk about happiness, we have to maybe, being both Jewish and Buddhist, we have to talk a little bit about suffering, first of all. Suffering is broken down in a lot of different ways as the first noble truth, but we could say some of the big sufferings are losing what you have, not meeting what you want, uh, meeting what you don't want, so it sounds like a typical day in the life, doesn't it? Or uh, the uh, quadruple birth sickness, old age, and death, I've got three of those going on already. So the uh, Tibetan and Bhutanese artists are very, very skillful at drawing these ornate uh, Baroque descriptions of this wheel of life and death and suffering and so on. Westerners tend to be a little more succinct and to the point, so we just draw it this way. <laughs> stress. What is stress? It is basically overwhelm. It's fight or flight. Uh, there's both eustress, which is good stress, and there's bad stress. So it is the balance between those two and our coping me mechanism to deal with a challenge or to be overwhelmed. And Hans Selye, who developed this uh, idea in our uh, current culture, said there's initially there's an alarm, then we resist against that, and if it goes on too long, then we're flattened. And of course, work is the greatest source of stress, according to many different forms of research. Why do we care about that? Because stress is the number one killer in this world. It causes high cortisol, which results in broad, widespread inflammation, immune suppression, and that res results in a whole host of different conditions. We're not going to go through all these, but 90%, it's estimated, of all doctor's visits are for stress-related complaints. Almost half of all adults suffer the adverse health effects from stress, so that's a drag. And again, up to 80% of workers in the USA say that stress is very heavy on the job, and uh, that there's more stress than there was a generation ago. But I'd like to point out the most important statistic on this page, which is that about 15% of workers in one year felt like striking a coworker. So my advice is identify those 14% and keep away from them. <laughs> so there is a little solution here, the mindfulness solution. How popular is this? 
It's on the cover of Time, Newsweek, Scientific American. Uh, we have this congressman, Tim Ryan, on the cover of Mindful Mag Magazine. But you know you're in trouble when Ben Affleck is on the cover of Vanity Fair Magazine promoting mindfulness. But why are we interested in mindfulness? And for the first time, I want to disclose a very profound uh, uh, architectural relic that has just been unearthed, which explains why people are seeking this solution. There it is there. Rubik's Cube. So modern day mindfulness, I'm not going to go through all of this because I'm sure our next speaker will. But I'm hoping to do what Kabat-Zinn did for Theravadan mindfulness meditation. I'd like to do that for Vajrayana. And basically what he did is he created a secular approach which had practical benefits, not just about getting enlightened but helping you day to day, that had measurement pre and post and had neuroscientific validation, and that became widely accepted by the scientific community, by institutions, and by business and corporations in general, along with a healthy boost of uh, marketing, of course, and some um, Oprah-like uh, celebrities. So here's a nice diagram of how modern-day mindfulness came to be, a dose of emotional intelligence and positive psychology, which arose around the same time. We already had the yoga revolution going on, Zen and Theravada were the ways that Kabat-Zinn, the author, uh, learned his Buddhism. And then we have the neuroscientific component, and there we have it. And there's a, the same diagram using the book covers that, are, that these individuals are famous for, full catastrophic living. And just a, a quick nod to positive psychology, because they have a really good definition of what happiness might be, what makes life most worth living, biological, personal, relational, institutional, cultural and global dimensions of life. And so you can go on the website of the Values and Action uh, group and you can take their survey and fill out the forums and find out what your 24 character strengths are. This is quite a good advance. And also another nod to emotional intelligence, Daniel Goleman's uh, child. And the four domains that he talked about are awareness of your own emotions, the ability to manage those emotions, awareness of other people's emotions, and how do you work with those relationships. And of course, this has been applied very broadly. And I do have a, a survey for you out there when you, when you leave today. There's a little survey you can take to check your emotional intelligence. But the full disclosure, I wanted to let people know that I did cheat on my emotional intelligence test. I looked over the shoulder of someone else and copied their answers because they seem more emotionally mature than me. So there you go. Uh, Con contemplative neuroscience is a whole new uh, branch of uh, science, investigating into neuroplasticity. In other words, there is now a neurological explanation of habits. And uh, all of these areas of the brain have been shown to be affected by meditation. Areas of the brain involved with emotional regulation, self-awareness, empathy, and so on and so forth. And I've, again, disclosed one of the most recent before and after uh, MRIs, functional MRIs, can show you what happens to the brain. There you go. Scientific validation. That was a joke. So the MBSR system, I'm not going to go through in great detail, but just to say it's mindfulness of breath, of your sensations, of your thoughts and feelings, letting them flow by. Just basically not at being attached, not grabbing onto things, and becoming very objective about your experience. So at this point, about 18 million Americans are meditating, about 1 million children, and I hope the parents know that their children are meditating, could be dangerous. It's a $4 billion industry. And because of that, there is some criticism that now it's undergoing a McDonaldization. In other words, it's become another consumer commodity. So there is that danger, of course. And uh, here's a nod to Headspace, the number one digital app. And it's quite incredible, these guided meditations for sports, for health, and you, for cycling, running, eating, cooking, everything under the sun. They've got 8.5 million subscribers at $12 a month. Buy stock in Headspace right away. Uh, there's at least 15 different ways that people can measure mindfulness, that researchers can measure it. The most popular one for the workplace is the first one, the MAS, the Mindful Attention and Awareness Scale. Again, outside as you leave, there is a Freeberg Mindfulness Inventory, a short one that you can take, and uh, I'm not responsible for the results. So how popular is this? Up to 40% of employers will offer mindfulness in 2017. That's quite incredible. And Google itself, with their Sealy Self, Search Inside Yourself Learning Institute, have trained over 20,000 managers and people in the 
uh, industry in hundreds of countries. So they're doing quite well. And this is just a sprinkling of some of the most visible companies that are doing this. Even Monsanto has had a whole program considered the most evil corporation in the world by people into the green. Uh, nonetheless, they've had mindfulness training. So what are the benefits? I'm, again, not going to go through all of these, uh, as I'm sure the other speakers will cover it, and the slides will be available, but quite a broad spe spectrum of benefits and uh, things to get rid of. I don't know if it can get rid of my cynicism. I'm still working on that one. So what's wrong with this picture? Isn't this all perfect? Why should we go any further? Well, yes, this is a, way, a form of relaxation, a form of better coping, but it's not a fundamental way of psychological change because you can be mindful to be a better thief. You could be mindful to be a better killer, which was what Bushido was all about, a better samurai. So this can actually be turned into any dimension you'd like. So the psychological effects of mindfulness are also secondary. In other words, when you're relaxed, you're letting things go and letting things flow, there's a lot of secondary psychological benefits. But you're not working directly with your creativity, with your wisdom, with your sense of leadership, your sense of empathy, not directly, it's quite indirect. And therefore, it's not a form of character development per se. And uh, we'll see why and as we get into Vajrayana mindfulness itself. So as I say, it's not really a guidance system. There's no map, there's no road, there's no real compass there. So here's where you are, basically. You've got a brand new fueled up car, where are you gonna go? But of course, I would even put it out to you that this is most of psychology and most of spiritual paths are in the same situation. They give you a lot of techniques, but there is no proper roadmap, not an accurate road. Did you know normal has not been defined in regular psychology? Isn't that the foundation of everything? But we don't know what normal is according to modern psychology. And all the psychological testing is done on random people, not on normal people, since we haven't picked those out from the crowd yet. So what is the Bhutan uniqueness here? We can reintegrate. We don't have to become secular in that sense because in Bhutan we can actually come out in the open and say, yes, this is a Buddhist practice. We can integrate Buddhist culture, lineage, traditions, get into Buddhist ethics. Ideas like karma can be integrated. We can integrate G and H principles and then create the measurement tools that integrate that wider uh, concept, more of a roadmap concept. And it is an internal solution. We've heard a lot about external solutions here, but I don't think you can legislate or create institutions that will transform people. You still have to work inside, inside and outside balance. So with uh, Vajrayana meditation, we're gonna see that you can have a direct effect on creativity, vitality, discriminating wisdom. You can actually directly work with your mind. It's quite extraordinary. And so, to introduce that, we have to think of the three turnings of the wheel of Dharma. We have the Theravadan, the first level that uh, came straight from the works of the Buddha. We have Mahayana meditation on loving kindness, compassion, and so on, transforming the mind and the negative emotions, level two. And then what I call level three Vajrayana mindfulness. Not that it's better, but it is different. It, there's different skillful means for different people. Vajrayana integration, there's mindfulness as we know it, this ability to focus or have an open uh, dimension to the mind is part and parcel of all Vajrayana meditation. It is part of your visualization of deities, of mantras, of working with the body's energy channels. It's foundational to all of that. So it's not missing. It's just what I'm talking about here is removing that requirement that we work with the more fantastical Baroque aspects of Vajrayana, which are not uh, readily uh, a lot, not readily something that people are interested in in the business community and so on. So refusing the benefits of mindfulness with Vajrayana. So to do that, we need a model, right? We need a model of the mind and a model of the process. So I asked them to get me a picture of a model. They sent me the wrong darn thing. I asked for a model again, another wrong picture. So finally, I got the right picture of a model. Now, if you've heard of Rube Goldberg from the 1950s, he drew these fantastic diagrams. Here's somebody who's trying to put some toothpaste on a toothbrush, and it takes 30 steps to get there, Rube Goldberg. So uh, science and psychology and so on likes to give us complex explanations for simple phenomena of life. I'd like to give you a simple explanation for the complex phenomena of life. So here is the three pillars of uh, elemental psychology or Vajrayana psychology. We have the triple self model, the pentad mind model, and the three phases. So with that, we can understand, I feel, everything about uh, human nature. 
And unfortunately, now I'm going to go from incongruous to controversial because I'm going to say this is psychology and spirituality's single biggest mistake, the first pillar, which is uh, the three-phase model of the self. Now, modern psychology, as you may know, looks upon the individual as one solid block. Our personality develops over time, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and we are who we are. And there may be Freud talked about a dark self, about an id, which now neuroscience confirms, of course. We're just a bunch of seething reptiles under there. The religious approach, and this goes Buddhist, Hindu, doesn't matter who you look at, it's basically a two-self model. We have our lower self with all our egoic demands and so on and desires and so on, and we have our higher self. We need, we need to negate or uh, relegate or uh, supersede, transcend our regular self and go to our higher self. I feel this is an erroneous model, and what we really need to have, the truth is, we have an essence, who we were born, our predispositions, our tendencies, our weaknesses, our strengths, and we have a higher self, of course, but there also is our conditioned self, what was given to us by our parents, by our school, by our conditioning, and so on, which continues on through our whole life. This is completely artificial. You can only upgrade it. And people do upgrade. You can get a Buddhist one, you can get a GNH one, and so on. But this is still a false construct. It's a necessary evil. It's how we interface with the world. It's our social self. But our true self, our essence, is the only thing that can really mature and grow up. And it is the one that interfaces with our spirit. So we have to look at this model much more carefully. We could spend two days talking about it. We won't. But this is the first pillar. The second, oh, oh, then the, the next controversy that stems from this is that uh, the myth is that spiritual development and the psychological development go hand in hand. And every Westerner that pretty much that I talk to thinks that if I just get enlightened, all my psychological issues will be resolved. And yet you find people that have been meditating in caves for 20, 30 years and they're psychological monsters. I have met some, rarely. But in reality, psychological development and spiritual development are parallel, non-intersecting paths of development. So you could get the possibility where you psychologically become much more mature, beautiful, balanced, wonderful person, but you haven't really changed in your spiritual interest, or you may become spiritually very powerful, and psychologically you go downhill, you're crude, uh, sex-obsessed, whatever the problem might be. The second pillar is the pentad mind, the five element model. We're all familiar with this wonderful model, the basis of the whole of Vajrayana Buddhism. And we know that there's also a physical aspect of this, the five elements, which makes up the basis of Ayurvedic medicine, of Buddhist um, Tibetan medicine and Buddhist medicine. But when I was in three year retreat, aha, I realized I've been staring at this model all along and I didn't realize it can also be applied to the psyche. And this is my map of the human psyche. We changed the names to warrior, creator, lover, guru, and ruler, and the whole of human psychology can be explained according to this map, believe it or not, and you will believe it. So the five elemental model says that everything is composed of the five elements, and it's hierarchical. In other words, you can see that same breakdown uh, spiritually, psychologically, physically. Each one has its own distinct characteristics. And they have specific colors, forms, and so on that have been determined by people with real spiritual insight. And so we can actually access, we can access these primordial forces of the world, of the psyche, and so on, through these forms, shapes, and so on that have a direct resonance with them. And it is really one of the glo uh, oldest continuous ideas in the world. And if I had time, I'd break down this diagram to you that shows the evolution of this idea from its ancient origins down through Vajrayana, through Ayurveda, Hinduism, and through the Western traditions and so on. So it's a continuous concept. And so if we looked, we just walk outside in Bhutan, we see those millions of prayer flags fluttering over the world. We see the stupas, we look at chakras, we think of the five Buddha families, we think of all the practices of Vajrayana, the different Yidam and deity practices, uh, Dakini practices, and all the tens of thousands of empowerments, such as the meditation we just had, it's all based on the five elements. Starship. So if we looked at those and... Yeah, one minute. Oh, this says another ten minutes. Uh, if we looked at these five powers, for example, the ruler is about stability, security, groundedness, leadership, knowing your place and knowing everything's place in the world. The lover is about connection, intimacy, nurturance, idealism, vision. Uh, the warrior is about your drive, motivation, your clarity, focus, and so on. 
your creators, your creativity, your ingenuity, your ability to manifest in the world, your gurus, your wisdom, and so on. Now, all of us have all five of these in us. And in a perfect world, wouldn't that be great? We walk around expressing ourselves in this way. Uh, and by the way, here's the five possible kinds of happiness. Based on the five elements, there must be five kinds of happiness. There's the Gandhi way, the Paul Newman way, the, and so on. So the warrior wants to succeed, the lover to connect, the ruler wants everything to fit, to be organized, the creator to manifest, and Yoda wants to know. So in a perfect world, that would be great. But unfortunately, that mandala, whoops, that mandala of the uh, five elements, of what I call the five ways of power, can easily become the five ways of loss, the deficiency. So the guru becomes the dummy, and then he goes into the dark side and becomes the charlatan. The warrior become, feels like a weakling, so he becomes the bully, etc. So now we have the 15 possible states of humanity within this form of psychology. And if we broke it down much further into the subdivisions, we'd have the five ways of power here, the five ways of loss, the five ways of shadow. And if you really want to get serious, we have the 225 modes of human interaction if you connect all those dots. It's quite extraordinary. Each one has a name, each one has a possibility. And there's nothing that people feel or do unless they're psychopaths or outside the realm of normalcy uh, that is not included here. So uh, the actual practice itself, using the form, the color, the breath, energy movements, and so on, using verbal formulas, we can directly access these. So for example, for the uh, space element, the wisdom element, we have remembrance to work on our power, we have reconnection to get rid of loss, uh, we have redemption to get rid of our shadow side, we repurpose ourselves, and then we take the next spiritual step. So that's 25 different meditations. Uh, you have a, a redemption of your entire psychology going on right there. And we have courses, books coming out in 2018. Here's my set of meditation cards that go with this. You can't read very well. So we don't really need more mindfulness. We don't really need more happiness. What we need is another acronym. So everybody, G-N-H-B-V-M-I. Everybody, G-N-H-B-V-M-I. Yeah, uh, thank you. Business Vajrayana Mindfulness Integration. Thank you very and, much. And uh, here is my email. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.